The 1980s were a tough time for General Motors as the auto company continued downsizing many of its models and in some cases went a bit or perhaps even a lot too far in downsizing key elements of their vehicle lineup. Many of the vehicles that came out in the 1980s were actually planned during the second oil crisis of the late 1970s. And as a consequence, many at General Motors thought that gasoline was going to be the equivalent of 5 to $6 per gallon when vehicles like the new 1986 Riviera were to debut. It also likely didn't help that GM was highly successful in a number of rounds of downsizing that really began with the 1977 full-size cars. These vehicles, despite their smaller size versus their predecessors, actually sold better than the 1976 models, and that perhaps gave General Motors some confidence that it could downsize effectively. Other vehicles in the lineup were also downsized and sales increased, including the A-body Intermediates for 1978, as well as the Cadillac Eldorado, Buick Riviera, and Olds Tornado for 1979. Moreover, GM had to attain corporate average fuel economy standards, which mandated that the company's corporate fleet-wide average fuel economy had to average north of 27 miles per gallon by the mid to late 1980s. As a consequence, cars needed to become smaller, engines smaller, and in some cases less powerful. And this was a pressing force on another round of downsizing across GM and other manufacturers' lineups. It was in this environment that Buick, Oldsmobile, and Cadillac planned their new cars for 1986, the Buick Riviera, the Olds Tornado, and the Cadillac Eldorado, as well as Seville. The cars would be radically downsized from their predecessors, which had a still rather large and commanding presence despite the fact that they were downsized versus their previous generation models. Let me start off by saying that I think not only the 1986 Riviera, but also the 1986 Tornado, Eldorado, and Seville are actually very handsome vehicles in their own light. The problem was that they were so different from their predecessors that they effectively lost the customer base of those vehicles. It's hard to imagine somebody who owned a 1979 to 85 Eldorado, Tornado, Riviera coming into a dealership showroom and seeing one of the successor models and saying, gosh, that's the vehicle that I want. It just was a totally different clientele of buyer. A younger, more affluent type was really the person who was going to buy one of these vehicles versus their predecessors. And so imagine one of the large problems with selling these vehicles with the dealer call sheets just really didn't have customers available for them that a dealer could pick up the phone and say, hey, come on in, trade in your vehicle. I've got something new to show you. Dealers had to source all new customers. And that's never a good place to be. In any case, the story of the 1986 Riviera begins with a few sketches that you can see here. These are full-size drawings that were done in Buick's studio during the time. Notice the rather sharply raked nose on the concept sketch, as well as the stubby back end. Now, the stubby back end and the overhangs were not something that were the choice of designers. This was based on the platform dimensions that they were given, and hence the full-size airbrush rendering that you see here, where designers are trying to see if the vehicle that they've sketched actually works over top of the platform. You'll notice at the rear, this upswept bumper that's trying to make the stubby rear end look more dignified. This was an approach that was actually employed on the 1986 Tornado to actually great effect. And so Buick turned away from it because one of their sister divisions was going to employ that. The car also has a pretty sporty flair and displays some elements of design that were pretty typical of GM design during the times, namely a very large upper greenhouse to make the cabin feel open and airy, something that you just don't see on cars today where the belt lines are very high and the roof lines are very low. The approach here was something different to try to make the occupants feel like they were in a spacious vehicle despite the car's overall size. A later proposal for the 86 Riviera had a more stately and formal elegance to it. You can see here that the C-pillar has transitioned to being more vertical, a la 1976 to 79 Seville, and also the 1985 C-cars that were debuting, the Electra, the Olds 98, as well as the Cadillac, DeVille, and Fleetwood. Notice also that the trunk deck lid here has a rake to it, kind of similar to the previous generation Buick. So I'm guessing the designers were trying to pull in some heritage and make the stubby rear look a little bit better. 
This design also displays a typical GM design characteristic of the time where the belt line is below the hood, again giving a overall glassy upper appearance to the vehicle and making the occupants feel like they're in a bigger car than they actually are. I actually find this design to be very clean and very tasteful, especially the thin roof atop there that even further accentuates the overall glassy feel from this side view. But again, it was just something that buyers were not accustomed to during this time period, especially and by the point the car was introduced, fuel prices had decreased to historic lows. So it was a terrible time to bring out a newly downsized car when fuel prices were back to around a dollar a gallon or below a dollar a gallon. As is typically the case after a full-size rendering is done, at least successfully, a full-size clay model was executed of that full-size airbrush rendering and you can see it here on GM's design patio. Notice the interesting headlamp treatment here as well as that sloping nose and a hood line that goes on to form a rather small mirror. A similar hood line would be employed on the later Buick Lucerne show car. And take a look out back, you can see here those tail lights again and the deck lid are cut in an angle similar to the previous generation Riviera. Unfortunately, as the car made it through to production, GM designers had to revise the front end and incorporate the typical sealed beam headlamps that General Motors thought would be required at this time frame. Remember, this was before the 1984 Lincoln Mark 7 had come out, which was the first vehicle to have flush composite headlamps. So GM actually was betting that sealed beams would be the only types of headlights that would be approved in the future and consequently redesigned this vehicle and others to incorporate them appropriately up front. It gave the front of the car a much more conventional look, but still pretty stately. Out back, the Riviera eventually lost its sloped deck lid as well as tail lights, mainly because designers couldn't meet their luggage volume criteria with that type of approach. So they had to stand the deck lid upright in order to enable customers to have the amount of packaging space that was required. Despite these compromises, I have to say that I think that this Riviera, the 1986 model, in particular the one that you're seeing here, remains a handsome design. Again, it was just different from what consumers were wanting at the time and really tough to introduce in a time of relatively low gas prices. However, there was another mistake that planners made that really sealed some of the Riviera's fate. And that was that Buick had come out with a similarly sized and looking N car, the Buick Somerset, one model year before the Riviera. It's never a good idea to have a more expensive car look like a less expensive car and come out later than that less expensive car. But that was the case with this Buick. And I don't believe the designers originally planned that to be the case. My guess is that the Riviera was planned before the Somerset, but ended up coming out later due to some platform delays. Nonetheless, that's what happened, and it certainly didn't help this poor little Riviera be successful in the marketplace. Here's a side view of the 1986 Riviera, and you notice that it does have some of the elements of those full-size renderings, yet it did have a different deck lid as well as a front end to accommodate some of those elements that I previously mentioned. Again, overall, still a very handsome design. Now, a real controversial element of the 1986 Riviera was its interior, which you can see here had a unique steering wheel that was only employed on the Riviera, as well as quite a bit of unique switch gear. The headlamp buttons, as well as the wiper buttons, are flanking the steering wheel in vertical stacks. That was an approach that had not been tried on the Riviera or other Buick vehicles before or since. And notice the long, skinny barrel vents on either side of those controls for the vent and air conditioning. There are also some new type controls like the window switches, which are behind the gear shift there on the center console, as well as the mirror control. Those are those two sets of switches that you see there. And of course, this one has a tape deck because you have to have a tape deck in your Riviera. This particular Riviera also has a flocked instrument panel, the glove box, as well as the left side of the dash have that kind of mouse fur feel to them, which I think is especially, well, unique for lack of a better term. And of course, the steering wheel has the cruise control buttons there on either side of the spoke. I do think that this is an interesting steering wheel for a number of reasons. Although, as I mentioned, it was just unique to the Riviera. I don't think I've seen a three-spoke design, particularly in Buicks, that's very similar here with thin spokes horizontally and a very thick center spoke. 
I think it's tasteful overall. However, take a look at that center stack and you see one element of this interior that was not very well accepted at the time and really was just way ahead of its time in vehicles. And that's Buick's electronic CRT display. Called the Graphic Control Center, this display controlled your climate control, your radio. You could also see engine gauges and run diagnostics through it as well as your trip computer. And you can see each of those functions had a button for it. Now, the one thing that really was a bit tough on this CRT was activating some of the functions. You can see here that the chiclets for the control for the volume, as an example, are pretty small. And people at this point were used to rotating knobs and pushing buttons that they really could activate by feel, not just by sight. Today, on touchscreens for vehicles, you'd have to take your eyes off the road to activate many functions, but that was taboo back in the mid-1980s, and many customers just simply wanted a button to rotate, and I would say even today many customers want that, and yet many automakers just don't do it. So this GCC, the Graphic Control Center, really was an innovative and pioneering feature that wasn't all that accepted by Buick's clientele. It was something that was very futuristic and would actually be a harbinger for what was to come only three to four decades later. I will point out one other interesting thing about the GCC and the buttons that you see here, and that's that General Motors spelled gauges, G-A-G-E-S, which it typically did. During this time period, General Motors was very focused on spelling words with alternate spellings, potentially even ones that to the outside world were not acceptable. But in ways that could save a letter because they believed it could save money. Internally, as an example, GM would spell employee with just one E at the end, two E's overall, because it believed that doing so would save money as each letter in an email that you were to type as an example back then or some correspondence would take up a certain amount of memory on a mainframe computer. And so saving that last E was going to save the company some money. It was kind of silly, but GM did it for a number of years, and you'll see in their employee handbooks that they spelled employee that way. As we pan back and take one final look at the interior, you'll notice that the seat design here is also pretty awesome and unique. It's got these suede inserts that almost look like you cut the leather, and then the leather opens up to expose its suede skin. I think it's an awesome looking design. Some of these Rivieras would have reversible seat covers as well that were very similar to the Packard Caribbean as an example, with the front side being cloth, the back side being leather. This one doesn't have it on this particular edition, but I thought that was another neat touch on the interior. So the interior of this 86 Riviera was really a technologically advanced, I think very handsome again design on this particular vehicle. And here's a better close up of these seats so you can see what I'm talking about. Pretty cool design that I really haven't seen before or since. And you notice that there's almost individual thigh rests, a la what Lincoln was doing a few years ago on some of its vehicles, although these are not individually adjustable. Under hood in these Rivieras would reside Buick's 3.8 liter engine that would make somewhere between 140 and 165 horsepower, depending upon which engine you had in which model year. 1988, of course, had the more powerful 3800 engine that had a balance shaft incorporated into it. 1986 and 1987 Rivieras of this design had a 90 degree 3.8 liter V6 pre-3800 series one that did not have a balance shaft and consequently it shook a little bit at I would say not idle speed but a little bit off idle kind of fast idle speed. GM engineers had tuned it to be pretty smooth at idle and pretty smooth at cruising operation, but at around 1,000 RPMs, did have a little bit of a shake to it. And it's also one of the few engines that GM produced where the connecting rods are not in the center of the pistons. That would later be revised on the 3800 as the banks of the V would be moved not to be perfectly opposite one another, but instead staggered, allowing the engine connecting rods to be moved back into the center line of the pistons. This was also a period during which GM was taking its engine dress up under hood very seriously, and you can see some well, interesting features here. First is that the spark plug wires aren't visible coming from the rear coil pack, and they kind of tuck underneath these covers so that you don't see them. And I think the most interesting design feature here is that the EGR valve has a plastic cover over top of it that serves no other function than looks.
But as I said, GM was into the looks under Hood at this period of time, especially with the 1984 Corvette. I think that's one of the first vehicles where it really started. And it made the underhood area look better as opposed to just dumping a plastic beauty cover over top of everything like they do today. 1987, which marks the model that's shown here, was also the first year that the MAF sensor had a different shape from what was introduced in the 1985C bodies in 1986, C and H bodies as well as the Riviera, where the center section was just a constant diameter circle, if you will, but here on the MAF sensor, that center section next down to a Venturi so that the air can increase its speed as it goes over the hot film. That would provide a better reading for the MAF sensor and cure a stalling condition that many of these vehicles would have. It also helped the GM put a honeycomb filter on the front side of the MAF sensor to help straighten out the airflow. So a little technical jargon for you on why these 1987s tend to run better than the 1986 Rivieras as well as the 19. 19- 85C bodies. And on that note, we conclude our discussion of the 1986 to 88 Riviera. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think of this review. Check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.